I call Minister Christopher Pincher to move the motion to disagree with the Lords in their Amendment 4J. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And in moving the Government's motion, I want first of all to thank all Right Honourable and Honourable Members for joining in this uh, crucial debate. Because all of us in this House agree residents deserve to be safe and to feel safe in their homes. I want to reiterate in the strongest terms the importance of this Bill as a step along the way to delivering that objective and the risk that we would create if we were to continue to allow these remediation amendments, however well-intentioned, to delay legislation. For this bill was introduced over a year ago. We are almost at the point of getting it onto the statute book, and it is vital that we remind ourselves of the fundamental purpose of what we are seeking to achieve. To provide, I'll give away in a moment, to provide much needed legal clarification of the Fire Safety Order 2005 and direct the update of the fire risk assessments to ensure they apply to structure, external walls, and flat entrance doors. I'll give way briefly to the right honourable gentleman because I want as many other members to speak as possible. I'm very grateful for giving way. Ministers have repeatedly said that leaseholders should not bear the costs of the cladding scandal. Why is he insisting today that they should? Minister. Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, the right honourable gentleman will know the very significant amount of public money that we have set aside to remediate those buildings most at risk of fire where serious injury might take place and the financial provisions that we have set aside also to help other leaseholders. If we do not resolve this bill this week, fire risk assessments will not cover those critical elements of which I spoke and they may continue therefore to be ignored by less responsible building owners. Moreover, the fire and Res rescue services will be without the legal certainty that they need to take enforcement action. Ultimately, that will compromise the safety of many people living in multi-occupied residential buildings. Without the clarification provided by the Fire Safety Bill, it will mean delaying implementation, possibly by a year, of a number of measures that will deliver the Grenfell Inquiry recommendations. Now, as I said, Madam Deputy Speaker, I want as many members to have the opportunity to speak as possible, so I'll say no more uh, than what I have done for the moment until I wind up the debate later, save for reiterating two points. First, these particular remaining amendments, whilst laudable in their intentions, would be unworkable and an inappropriate means to resolve a problem as highly complex as this. And second, the Government shares the concerns of leaseholders on remediation costs and has responded, as the House will know, with unprecedented levels of financial support to the tune of over £5 billion, with further funds from the developer tax, which the Treasury will begin to consult upon imminently, as well as the tall buildings levy. The developers themselves have now begun to announce more significant remediation funds. It's in everyone's interest, Madam Deputy Speaker, to ensure that we do not put the progress made at risk by failing to get this bill on the statute book by the end of this session. The question is that this House disagrees with the Lords in their Amendment J. Um, before I call the um, Shadow Minister, uh, just to reiterate, this is a very short debate with a long list of um, speakers, which is why I've put a three-minute limit on for backbenchers. But obviously, if colleagues can be shorter than that, we might actually get everybody in. Uh, Shadow Minister Sarah Jones. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, the Sunday Times reported two days ago that the Bank of England is worried that the Britain's building safety scandal could cause a new financial crisis. The Bank is worried about the scandal's impact on property values, as new data from the Leasehold Knowledge Partnership shows that fire risk flats can sell for as little as one-third of their purchase prices. 
Madam Deputy Speaker, this is devastating and requires an immediate response from the Government. This Government surely does not need reminding that a collapse in house prices triggered the global financial crisis in 2007, but it seems that they do. And it seems they also need reminding of the misery this crisis is causing hundreds of thousands of people. The safety scandal that has unravelled in the wake of inaction and indecision since the Grenfell Tower fire in 2017 has left up to 1.3 million flats unmortgageable and affects thousands of recently built houses. As many as 3 million people face a wait of up to a decade to sell or get a new mortgage because they cannot prove their homes are safe. And we have leaseholders who face repair bills of up to £75,000 for floors such as flammable cladding, balconies and missing fire breaks. Madam Deputy Speaker, we stand here today while thousands watch this debate and suffer, worrying about their futures, getting into debt, facing bankruptcy. And we have to ask ourselves, what does this government actually care about? They don't appear to care that the Bank of England thinks we're heading for a financial crisis. They don't appear to care that thousands and thousands are living in, with anxiety, fear and debt. They don't seem to care that the vague and undefined loan scheme that they've hailed as the answer, despite having promised many times that leaseholders won't have to pay, will damage people's property prices and won't actually be in place, we hear today, for at least two years, leaving thousands to pay mountain waking watch bills and stuck in properties they can't sell. I, will give I completely agree with the points my friends raising, and she will know the suffering of my own constituents in Cardiff, South and Penarth. Does she agree with me that the government, the UK government, needs to get around the table with the Welsh government and provide clarity on how those taxes are going to work, how money is going to flow from that building levy and the tax? They haven't yet done that. We finally had an answer to the letter from the Welsh Housing Minister, and the Welsh government's put aside money, but they're not clear how much money is coming from the UK government. Yeah. My honourable friend has raised this point many times and is standing up for his constituents in a way that I'm afraid this government will not. What does this government care about? We are left with one possible answer. Does this government only care about the donors who keep its Prime Minister in fancy furniture? So the Prime Minister can spend £60,000 on curtains in number 10, while there are nurses and key workers out there facing £60,000 bills for cladding and no wealthy do Tory donors to bail them out. Does this government really only care about big property developers such as European Land and Property who developed a block of flats in Paddington which used the same ACM cladding as was on the Grenfell Tower and have donated £2.5 million to the Conservative Party since the Grenfell Tower fire in 2017? Does this government really only care about Britain's biggest builders who have built up vast profits during the pandemic such as Persimmon, which the the, 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 the Minister is shouting names at me from a, from a sedentary position, but is not answering the question. I don't want to be right. I don't want that to be what the Government cares about. I honestly always believe the best in people and applaud my colleagues from across the House who have stood up for their constituents time and again on this. But even they are asking, why else is the Chancellor and the Prime Minister ignoring a financial and a human crisis on such a growing and worrying scale. So let us vote today to start putting this right and prove me wrong. Mr Speaker, Madam Deputy Speaker, forgive me, it's not just opposition members who are supporting amendments to protect leaseholders today. A recent poll from YouGov, commissioned by the National Housing Federation, found that three quarters of MPs, including two thirds of Conservative MPs, say the government should pay the costs of all building safety work up front and then claim it back later from those responsible. I haven't heard a single argument that bears any scrutiny as to why it's OK to let leaseholders foot a bill of tens of thousands of pounds or why it's OK to sit by as homeowners face bankruptcy or decades of lingering debt. We welcome the latest amendment from the Bishop of St Albans. This amendment would put into law a guarantee that building owners cannot pass on the costs of any remedial work to leaseholders in the time before the Government brings forward its promised legislation. I'm also very interested in the amendments put down by the Right Honourable Member for North Somerset, which propose that the Government should be following the polluter pays principle. And yet again, the Government has decided to lay a motion to disagree with the Lord's amendment. This is a betrayal of the promise that ministers have made over 17 times that leaseholders would not be left to foot the bill. 
And the Minister's argument that this would delay further works does not work. If the Government haven't managed to work out how to pursue the money from those responsible yet, why don't they do what's right and stop leaseholders from footing the bill now? The Bishop of St Albans Amendment would buy the Government some time. It would protect leaseholders while the Government come up with a longer-term plan. So we want to ask the Minister again, if he doesn't think that the proposed amendments are right as they are, why not amend them? And why, when it is directly in their gift, won't the government pay to fix these problems and then go after the building companies and developers who are responsible? Leaseholders deserve justice now. I want to end, Madam Deputy Speaker, by remembering the 72 people who lost their lives in the Grenfell Tower fire nearly four years ago. The inquest is a daily reminder of the impact of the bonfire of regulations under David Cameron and the lack of care uh, that the government took over the last 11 years. For the memory of those who died, we must right these wrongs. We must learn the lessons. We must protect the hundreds of thousands who face daily uncertainty, fear and bills. I say to all members, back the bishop today, vote for the Lord's Amendment and start to put this right. Uh, we now move to the three-minute time limit. Royston Smith. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. The, uh, the longer this debate drags on, the more damaging it becomes to the government and the worse it becomes for innocent leaseholders. On Saturday evening, there was a fire in the tallest tower block in Southampton. This building has ACM cladding, and as I understand it, it was a light. Hampshire Fire and Rescue responded quickly and dealt with it with their characteristic professionalism. Fortunately, this fire was not too serious, but it could have been. What would we be saying today if the worst had happened, I wonder? I've said from the start, there are three dimensions to the fire safety scandal, the moral, the economic and the political. The moral obligation is obvious. The government, this government, has a duty to hold those that are responsible to account and to defend the innocent leaseholders. There should be no disagreement, Madam Deputy Speaker, on that issue. Second, the economic. The government clearly thinks that my concerns about toxic debt, mass bankruptcy and repossession are wrong. But it's not just me that thinks it is a risk. The Bank of England is concerned too, as just been said. So concerned are they that they are assessing whether this fire safety scandal could cause a new financial crisis. With up to 1.3 million flats unmortgageable, perhaps the government should be a little more concerned about the economic issue too. Finally, the political. The government believes in the homeowning democracy. It defines us. We have encouraged it, we have incentivised it. In fact, many people would not be in their own property without the support of government. So how do we look ourselves in the mirror when we have helped people to buy a home in a dangerous building which is worth less, sometimes much less, than they paid for it? The truth is, Mr. Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, most MPs, including Conservative MPs, agree that the government should resolve this issue. <coughs> they believe, as I do, that it should not be the taxpayers despite what some in government have been saying. It should be those who are responsible, the manufacturers, developers, NHBC, uh, NHBC, the development control. Some of those, of course, are local authorities. The government can underwrite what is needed and then take it back from the industry. It may take years, but we'll charge them interest too. But it should be those that are responsible that pay. Mr. Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, we have been accused of wanting to kill the fire safety bill. Nothing could be further from the truth. If the government wanted to, the bill to succeed as much as I do, they would do what was necessary to get the bill through this place and the other place, but they have thus far chosen not to. After today, the fire safety bill will go back to the Lords, where it will, in all likelihood, come back again. It may come in a different name and moved by someone else, but if that happens, the bill may well fall. Madam Deputy Speaker, that won't be my fault or our fault. That will be the government's fault. We now go to Hilary Benn. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. It's a great pleasure to follow the Honourable Gentleman. Well, here we are again debating a Lord's Amendment to protect leaseholders from ha having to pay to fix construction defects and unsafe cladding, which never were and never should be their responsibility. And yet ministers continue to resist, even though they have repeatedly said that leaseholders shouldn't have to bear the cost. And the trouble with this endless debate is that the clock is ticking and innocent leaseholders continue to face unreasonable costs as bills now start to arrive demanding sums of money that they simply do not possess. 
One constituent wrote to me last week, enclosing a photograph of the bill he's just been sent for £27,000. Another thinks their bill will be £40,000. They obviously can't remortgage their flats. So I asked the minister, what are people in this situation meant to do? Now, sadly, we know that the government doesn't have an answer to this or indeed to the mental and emotional torment that they're being put through. And that is why this amendment is needed and needed now. Even taking account of the government funding already announced, the Leasehold Knowledge Partnership estimates that about two thirds of the total cost is still going to fall on leaseholders, the very people the government says shouldn't pay. The Association of Residential Managing Agents estimates that the average remediation bill will be around £50,000 a flat and that insurance costs have risen by 400%. The government estimates that the average cost of a waking watch outside London is over £2,100 a year for each flat. Leaseholders in shared ownership properties are in a particular bind. The building safety fund is moving too slowly. There's a shortage of companies who can or will do the work. And there's total uncertainty as to what is meant to happen when we know that there are other works that have to be done to make buildings safe, but for which the government is not prepared so far to offer funding. Now, I find it very hard to believe that ministers don't understand that the remedy they have come forward with so far is patently insufficient, or that they don't get that without a comprehensive plan, leaseholders will, month by month and year by year, inevitably face financial collapse because of the huge burden of costs being put on their shoulders. So in conclusion, Madam Deputy Speaker, can I assure the Minister that the growing number of MPs who support the Lord's Amendment aren't going anywhere? And that's because our constituents have nowhere else to go. Thank you. We now go to Stephen McFartland. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. It's a pleasure to be able to speak in this debate. It's unfortunate that this is the third time the House of Lords has felt it necessary to return this bill to the House of Commons. It's because their lordships, like many MPs across the House, feel that this bill cannot progress without some form of protection for these holders. It completely astonishes me that people who cannot hear in government the screams of pain of these holders begging for help, people who are going bankrupt, people who are being hit with insurance premiums. We were told only last week of what the insurance premium for the building was £11,963 last year. This year, it's £242,400. People being hit with bills of £6,000 each in seven days to pay them. No recourse to help. Waking watches, interim bills that are just going through the roof. Leaseholders can't pay this. They can't afford this. The reality is that these bills are not going to be made safe by transferring the financial and legal liability onto leaseholders to do it. Leaseholders don't have the funds to fix it. Like my colleague, the member for Southampton, Itchen, has said, myself, leaseholders and leaseholders groups do not want the taxpayer to pay. We just want the taxpayer to provide a safety net to help. We believe that those responsible should pay, nobody else. Nobody wants this bill to fail. We're nearly four years on from Grenfell. The ministers mentioned Grenfell in his opening statement. I'd like to read in a statement that's been issued by Grenfell United. The fire safety bill's back in the Commons. Government is using the excuse that the amendment will delay Grenfell recommendations. The amendment is to protect leaseholders from charges. The fire safety bill is separate and it's wrong to claim support if it damages recommendations. Using Grenfell recommendations to justify government's indifference is deeply upsetting for us and shows they'd rather protect the corporates responsible for paying for the mess they created. Our request is simple. Implement Grenfell recommendations, make homes safe, and protect leaseholders from financial ruin. Nearly four years since Grenfell, and yet not a single piece of legislation has been passed. Homes have to be made safe. This is a basic human right. We ask all MPs that committed to ensuring Grenfell too could not happen to do the right thing today by us and the thousands of leaseholders affected. So, Madam Deputy Speaker, Grenfell United and the people affected there have spoken. Leaseholders up and down the country are speaking. Our constituents are speaking. 
members of Parliament are hearing them. And the Bishop of St Albans has tabled an amendment to try and provide the government the opportunity and the time and the space to come forward with a compromise. I urge the government to compromise and bring forward an amendment in the House of Lords later today to help support these holders. Matthew Pennycook. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I'm extremely grateful for the opportunity to speak so early in this important debate, and it's a pleasure to follow the Honourable Gentleman. Can I start by thanking their Lordships for the tenacity and perseverance they've shown over many months in standing up for all the blameless leaseholders affected by the cladding crisis? including the many thousands who live in one of the more than 70 affected buildings in my constituency. In seeking last week to persuade their lordships to cease insisting on amendments designed to protect all leaseholders from remediation costs, the Minister for Building Safety argued once again that such provision was unnecessary and that to continue to seek to amend the bill in such a way would risk its passage in this session, could increase fire safety risks and might, and I quote, ultimately cost lives. Yet it's the very fact that this crisis is already ruining countless numbers of lives that led their lordships to insist once again that this place reconsider, and they were entirely right to do so. Would my honourable friend give way? I will give way. I'm, I'm grateful to him for giving away. I agree with what he said. I wonder if he's visited claddingscandalmap.co.uk, which maps 450 buildings with 60,000 homes affected by this scandal, and shows as well those members of this House who are voting to force leaseholders to pay towards the costs. I, has, I thank the uh, Honourable Friend for that intervention. I have seen the site in question. It brings home, and I know he'll share this with me, uh, being his constituency so close to mine, that certain parts of the country, including constituencies like ours with high numbers of new build properties, are particularly badly affected. And I've got, uh, I think, tens of thousands of constituents so affected. Um, as welcome as it was, the five-point plan and the additional grant funding announced on the 10th of February by the government is still only a partial solution to the cladding crisis, and one that consciously and deliberately leaves a significant proportion of leaseholders exposed to costs they cannot possibly hope to bear. For significant numbers of leaseholders, that exposure is not some theoretical future risk, but a reality they are already confronting. To take just one example, I had a lengthy exchange yesterday with the RTM directors of a small 24-unit building in East Greenwich, Blenheim Court, that requires urgent remediation and is under 18 metres in height. As things stand, not only are the leaseholders in question living with the punishing uncertainty of not knowing if and when their building might be issued with a forced loan of the kind the government propose, but because they don't have the funds to commence remediation works until it is, they're struggling with a myriad of secondary costs, including a soaring building's insurance premium that has led their service charges to increase from around £2,500 a year per flat to over £130,000. And I've seen the invoice, the figure is correct, with a very real risk of mass defaults as a result. Every week that this House fails to act sees more leaseholders placed in similar situations and put at risk of negative equity and bankruptcy. Now, I have absolutely no doubt that the Government will ultimately be forced to bring forward a more comprehensive solution that protects all affected leaseholders from the cost of fixing both cladding and non-cladding building safety defects, because seeking to pass the costs on to even a proportion of them will almost certainly mean the works simply don't get done. But unless this House is content to follow that path and see many more lives needlessly destroyed in the interim, it must act today and take decisive steps towards resolving this crisis. I urge ministers, even at this late stage, to honour the commitments previously given from that dispatch box and come forward with a sensible concession. But if they don't, I urge MPs from across the House to protect blameless leaseholders and support the amendment in the name of the Lord Bishop of St Albans in the division lobby shortly. Dr Liam Fox. Madam Deputy Speaker, I rise to move the amendment in my name and I would like to say how grateful I am uh, for the support from all parties uh, in moving these amendments. I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank my colleagues from uh, uh, Stevenage and Southampton Itchen for the work that they have done on this issue. We have to find a way forward. We cannot continue this sterile ping-pong between the two Houses of Parliament. We need an actual plan, and I believe that my amendment set out a workable way that uh, the Government can take this issue forward. There are three issues that I think need to be dealt with fundamentally. Number one, the issue of forfeiture. The idea that people should be able to have their properties repossessed because they've been unable to pay cladding costs, which are unjust in the first place, is abhorrent. 
and we need to get reform of leasehold legislation to enable that to happen. Secondly, we need to have a proper plan for apportionment of costs, and as I set out in the appropriate persons for fire safety order costs amendment. And, and that means that we do not have a blank cheque that taxpayers are asked to spend, nor do we have the ability of those who have responsibility to collapse a company uh, so that they can avoid costs at a future date. We've got to ensure that polluter pays principle is applied in this particular case. And the third thing that we need is a real-time study done by the department to look at real people with real bills facing real negative equity and insurance issues today, difficulty accessing uh, the... Uh, the Building Safety Fund with very narrow timescale set and too few experts able to actually get them into the process itself. And I therefore suggest the following to the Minister. How do we do it? First of all, on the 11th of May in the Queen's speech, in leasehold legislation, we need to bring this issue forward and deal with it once and for all. Uh, and the Government have the ability to give us that assurance today. Secondly, in the building safety legislation that's coming forward, the long title of that bill needs to be framed in such a way that we can deal with amendments relating to appropriate persons for fire safety order costs. That is also within the Government's gift. And thirdly, might I suggest that he looks at my own constituency in Portishead as a microcosm of the problems that we have. Some buildings above 18 metres, some below. Some with good management, some with poor management. People who have got good copies of all the bills and can tell a story to real officials in real time. All these things, Madam Deputy Speaker, are possible. I set them out in these amendments today as a route out of the sterile position in which we find ourselves. We can't simply continue passing it between the two Houses of Parliament because our voters expect Parliament to come forward with solutions. And I, I say to the Minister that I think there is a genuinely practical way forward that we can find. We're two weeks away from the Queen's speech. We can bring this legislation forward. We can enable the House to come together to provide solutions for our constituents in a way that they have a right to expect and we have a duty to provide. Yeah. <coughs> um, we now go to Shabana Mahmood. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. Four years have passed since the Grenfell tragedy, and once again, this House is debating whether or not to protect leaseholders from the costs of remedying fire safety defects caused by a failure of regulation and negligent as well as deceptive practices in the building industry. Meanwhile, the government continues to dither and delay and orders its MPs to vote against amendments designed to protect leaseholders. And make no mistake, Madam Deputy Speaker, the funds that the government has made available thus far have taken too much time Time to come on stream. The money is not ultimately going to be enough to meet the scale of this crisis and crucially interim costs are not covered because on top of all of these costs we have today heard Madam Deputy Speaker about the cost of insurance. I have lost count of the times I have pleaded with this government to do something about insurance costs because in my constituency we have seen insurance increases in affected buildings of a thousand percent. These are shocking figures but it's a shocking situation that is falling on deaf ears as far as this government is concerned. Long before any cladding is removed from these buildings, these people living within them will have been ruined by the costs of insurance and entering measures such as waking watches to keep their buildings open. There is simply nothing left to remedy the internal fire safety defects as well. So leaseholders need the protection that the Lord's Amendment would offer. And we should never forget that at any point, a further tragedy could, God forbid, occur. This is a terror that leaseholders at Brindley House and my constituency have had to face because on the 31st of January this year there was a fire in a flat in their building. I have seen the burnt out husk of that flat for myself. The fire service have said that the residents were only two minutes away from the fire engulfing the whole of their building. Two more minutes and the windows in that flat would have shattered and the cladding that is wrapped around that building would have caught fire. When I heard that, Madam Deputy Speaker, my blood ran cold. Can the Minister imagine what it must be like for the people that live in Brindley House? This is the risk, this is the fear, and this is the scale of the financial ruination that people all over the country and in my constituency are trying to cope with. One of my constituents recently said to me that he now thinks it will be less stressful to declare himself bankrupt and become homeless than to try and find a way to carry on as a leaseholder. At the very least, Madam Deputy Speaker, the government could and should support the Lord's Amendment today or signal a further clear way through this crisis so that we can send a clear signal to all leaseholders that we will stand with them. Thank you. We now go to Bob Blackman.
Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And I start from the principle that successive Secretaries of State and Ministers have said from the dispatch box that the leaseholders are the innocent parties in this scandal and they should not have to pay a penny to piece towards the costs of remediation. I applaud the government on coming forward with £5.1 billion of public money to support the remediation of unsafe cladding. However, our problem is it's not enough. The estimate now is that it's 15 billion will be required and that extra 10 billion will have to come from leaseholders uh, as the last resort because building owners will naturally pass that on to leaseholders wherever they possibly can. They are the ones in situ. They're the ones facing these huge bills. Now, the government says that further proposals will come forward on the forced loan scheme. Now, we were promised in the earlier statement in February that the, the loan scheme would be announced at the budget. Now, I did make the assumption that this was the budget in 2021, not the budget in 2022 or 2023, because the reality is that the evidence that's been given to the HCLG Select Committee and other bodies suggests that the forced loan scheme is nowhere near availability. So we as members of parliament are not even able to scrutinise that proposal. So for those that are living in blocks of flats which are six uh, floors or below, we don't even know how that scheme will work. My estimate is that many of those people will end up with a bill that lasts for 100 years, therefore factoring in almost inevitably a dramatic reduction in the value of their properties. Equally, we know that the fire safety remediation that is required in addition to the remediation of unsafe cladding almost dwarfs the cost of remediating the cladding. All those costs, once again, will be passed on to the innocent leaseholders. Now, I understand my, my honourable friend on the front bench has got to defend this position and clearly wants to get the fire safety bill on the statute books. Let us be clear, I don't think any MP wishes to prevent progress of the fire safety bill. But what we do need is surety and assuredness because the draft building safety bill will take almost certainly 18 months to two years to bring to fruition. The leaseholders do not have that time to wait. So my honourable friend has made clear on a number of occasions that he finds the amendments defective. Well, there is still time. I agree with the Honourable Member, Right Honourable Member for North Somerset, that there's a solution going forward. If the government rejects that solution, let the government come forward with its own solution in the House of Lords, and let's agree that the leaseholders do not have, do not have to pay a penny and the fire safety bill can go through on the statute books, as we all would like to see. We now go to Barry Gardner. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. The Minister should be very careful. The speeches in this debate today are an example of Parliament at its best and government at its worst. Across the House, the Minister has heard members from all sides, his own party in particular, criticising what government is doing. If he is a minister that listens to Parliament, he would be very wise. If he refuses to listen, I think he should think about his future. In March this year, leaseholders in Wembley Central apartments in my constituency were told that in response to the publication by the government of the Building Amendments Regulations 2018, a waking watch system would be implemented as soon as possible. The cost of the waking watch patrols will be recovered from leaseholders in the sum of £91,380 a month. The cost of the remedial works to the fire alarm system across central apartments, Ramsey House and Metro apartments, is estimated to be in the order of £250 to £300,000. We're unable to say, the, the owner said, what the total cost of all the four recommendations will be, and therefore they can't advise the liability of each leaseholder. I find it unbelievable, uh, unacceptable that the government is imposing billions of pounds of costs on leaseholders retrospectively to remedy misconduct by others, such as the developer, the builder, or those producing the government's own advisory documents, and in particular, building regulations control. 
The fire survey for these particular buildings said there is evidence that the junctions between compartment floors were inadequately fire stopped, as there were gaps at mineral wool fire barriers at steel framing. There were no visible fire barriers at vents or around window door frames, and it could not be confirmed that the window door frames themselves formed cavity barriers. This indicates that at the time of construction, the building regulations in force at the time were not followed. That means that these people were sold a building that was not fit for habitation. Yet the government is not pursuing the people responsible. It is actually making sure that it is the innocent parties that will pay. Their lives are being ruined, as members on all sides of this House have said. It's vital that the government address this. It's vital that they accept the Lord's Amendment. And in particular, they need to focus on addressing the very real issues in building control regulations that allowed this scandal to happen in the first place. Derek Thomas. Um, De Deputy Speaker, the government's plan and funding to address this fire safety issue mm. is a welcome start, and I'm not going to rehearse the points already made this afternoon. However, I believe that the role of affordable home ownership schemes in this disaster has been overlooked. Many people engulfed in this scandal are first-time buyers who took their first home onto the took their first step onto the property ladder through conservative-backed schemes intended to boost home ownership. People use these schemes because they are not cash rich, but they are now facing unexpected bills for life-changing sums and some are being asked to take out further government loans to pay them. The drafting of this bill means that despite owning only part of the value of their flat, leaseholders are potentially liable for 100% of the share of the costs. In effect, they are subsidising their landlords who own the remaining percentage of the value of the flat but pay nothing to remedy build defects. Do you build defects? Leaseholders have always had to pay for the maintenance and upkeep of buildings they don't own due to the way leasehold agreements work. But the building defects and costs involved um, to fix them are beyond what anyone could have contemplated. And Madam Deputy Speaker, we do permit I'd like to read um, a case study of a constituent or a future constituent hoping to relocate to my constituency. This individual owns a, owns a one-bedroom flat in the Olympic Village in London, which she has a 35% interest um, to move to Penzance to be with her fiancé, Penzance in my constituency. The flat was sold to her as a low-risk investment encouraged by the shared ownership government scheme as part of their affordable housing <coughs> directive. Her block was found to have missing fire cavity barriers, rendering it a B2 rating, warrant, B2 rating warranting remediation with the bills potentially being in excess of £50,000 for her flat alone. The housing association are trying to bring the developers to account, something which legally they are not required to do. And failing that, it will result in a lengthy legal battle, during which she may well be presented with a bill for re remediation work in order to make the block, fire block, the block fire safe and adhere to government's new guidelines. Applying for a grant from the generic announcement for remedi remediation work is extremely slow and a complicated process. If the Housing Associ Association does not succeed in getting the perpetrators to fix this mess, then she will get the bill. And as a shared ownership, she'll be liable to pay for the 100% of the bill, not the 35% that she actually owns of the property. In any case, it's un highly unlikely she'll be unable, it is highly unlikely she'll be unable to sell the property for years to come and buy into the Cornish economy by purchasing a house. The member for North Somerset has put forward very pragmatic proposals to unlock the deadlock and improve the fire safety of house, homes of people across our nation. I will welcome the Minister's response to these sensible, uh, the sensible proposals. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. We now go to Daisy Cooper. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Over the weekend, it was reported that the Bank of England is assessing whether Britain's building safety scandal could cause a new financial crisis. Why? Because 1.3 million flats are unmortgageable. As many as 3 million people face a wait of up to 10 years to sell or get a new mortgage because they cannot prove that their homes are safe. Madam Deputy Speaker, this scandal has gone on for too long. It has already caused too much damage. This government must accept the Lord's Amendment that would protect leaseholders from exorbitant costs, or it should drop this bill altogether and bring back a better version in the Queen's speech. It is simply incredible that the government has had 10 whole months 
to break the deadlock and propose a solution that it finds acceptable, but it has refused to do so. Instead, the government wages a campaign of scaremongering, telling us that if the bill fails, it will have the effect of increasing fire safety risks. Well, Madam Deputy Speaker, that is not the view of leaseholders in my constituency. It is not the view of the leaseholder groups, and it is not the view of the Cladding Action Group. They are speaking with one voice, and they are clear. They would much rather see this defective bill fall than see it passed in its current form. The devastating consequences of accepting this bill unamended cannot be overstated. Millions of leaseholders who are already facing financial ruin through no fault of their own live with the terror of this bill passing into law. Because if it does, they will be landed with even more extortionate bills, perhaps within a matter of days. The government's intransigence, its outright refusal to budge, is making the situation so much worse to the point where I believe that we now need an inquiry into the government's response to the fire safety scandal. How much money have leaseholders already had to pay out? How many people have been driven to bankruptcy? How many have been made homeless? How many leaseholders have been pushed to the brink of suicide? Does the government really think it's OK for three million people to have to wait up to 10 years before they are free to live in a fire safe home? Does the government think it is acceptable that leaseholders have no viable legal routes to challenge those who are responsible? The cladding scandal and the fire safety scandal have been a protracted nightmare for leaseholders and the government's failure to address the fire safety scandal properly is now a scandal in itself. I urge all colleagues to support the Lord's Amendment today because millions of homeowners are relying on us all to do so. Sir Ian Duncan Smith. Thank you, Speaker. Um, I, I want to raise the issue in uh, my support to hold this Lord's Amendment. I, I think it's the right thing to do at the moment, not because this Lord's Amendment is perfect. It's far from perfect. It's not without its flaws. But my problem is that I don't see the government at the moment responding to what is an overwhelming concern about what's happening to leaseholders, many of whom, as has been said before, were first-time buyers. <clears throat> and I think we face, therefore, an issue uh, today of uh, concern both personal and public. The public concern is that the devaluation of these homes is so dramatic now that it will cause an economic shock. Now, I remember the old negative equity problem uh, which erupted as a result of a collapse, and I do not want to see us back there again. So the government, uh, I accept, has been said already, that the government has already put £5.1 billion uh, into this process, but it is worth at least another £10 billion in settlement, and that is going to fall on the shoulders of leaseholders. I just want to relate what's going on just in mine, like everybody else's. I have a, a set of estates, Queen Mary's Gate and Blackbury Court, uh, <clears throat> amongst other blocks in my constituency, many of them under the 18 metres, and they have cladding, and this is the point that is being raised, that was not compliant at the time of their building. Uh, the leaseholders didn't know that. They bought these uh, with a sense that they were buying something that was right and was reasonable, uh, and they're not eligible now for the safety fund because uh, of all of this. What's happened? So trying to get hold of the developers, Telford Homes, and they absolutely have not engaged now for over a year. They don't answer anything. They don't, uh, they don't engage about what they might do. They've gone to ground. And that's the problem that lies at the heart of all of this right now. There is no way that the leaseholders can get redress because they can't go to those who did this wrongly at the time and the government hasn't brought forward any way and any mechanism to make or allow leaseholders to get after these individuals. And they'll sit there and wait for the leaseholders to waste their money. So I know the Lord's Amendment is not perfect, but what I'm trying to do is articulate a cry for help from my constituents and others around the country. My right honourable friend's uh, amendment, which I have supported uh, for North uh, Somerset, uh, I agree with that. Let us find a way to make sure those that were responsible now stand up and pay the bill. They've made a lot of money in the past, legitimately, on building homes. These who did not put the right cladding, they should automatically be in the frame. Meanwhile, the costs spiral, and my constituents will pay that cost. So tonight, for the first time, I am going to vote to maintain and hold this Lord's Amendment. And I say to the government, if you don't want this, 
then you better get to the Lords and get us something decent that allows us to give support to our leasehold constituents because that would be doing the right thing. Uh, we now go to Rebecca Long Bailey. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I speak in favour of the Bishop of St Albans Amendment. As UK Cladding Action Group have reported previously, there have already been leaseholder suicides, and worryingly, 23% of those surveyed by the group had considered suicide or self-harm. So the government must realise that the Building Safety Fund only covers unsafe cladding, yet 70% of buildings surveyed have non-cladding fire safety defects. They must understand that providing cladding remediation funding for buildings over 18 metres, yet forcing leaseholders in buildings under 18 metres to pay, is entirely unfair. And they must recognise that there is no support available at all for interim measure costs, including increased insurance premiums and waking watches, which have often run into figures of over £15,000 per week. And to add further devastation, as we've heard today, Inside Housing has reported that even those minority of leaseholders who could apply for loans potentially face waiting years. In the meantime, many residents still live in unsafe buildings and are understood to have already received requests for upfront payment, with pre holders sometimes instructing solicitors to carry out debt recovery. This could result in a tide of bankruptcies and evictions. The situation is so bad that I understand that analysts at the Bank of England are now assessing whether Britain's building safety scandal could cause a new financial crisis. So it's clear the government's approach is untenable and it must change today. Even the National Housing Federation states that the only way to prevent leaseholders and social landlords having to pay to remediate buildings they did not construct is for the government to provide upfront funding to remediate all buildings. So I hope all MPs today can recognise the moral duty they personally have to protect their constituents and please vote in favour of the Lord's Amendment. Thank you. Uh, we now go to Sir Robert Neal. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. I very much had hoped it wouldn't be necessary for us to be continuing to have this debate in relation to this bill. The core elements of the bill are worthwhile, and I support them. But unfortunately, they create a liability, a set of potential liabilities, upon wholly innocent leaseholders without giving them giving uh, an adequate means of redress. And that is simply unfair. It is unfair on constituents of mine. It's unfair upon people who have bought properties in good faith and relied upon professional advice and uh, the uh, regime, uh, regulatory regime, which was then in force. If there are people who are at fault, either in the structure of the buildings or the way in which surveys were carried out, absolutely, they should be held to account. But the people who should not end up with a liability are the leaseholders who have acted in good faith throughout. And it's the absence of, of protection for them which regrettably causes me to have to support uh, the uh, Lord's uh, Amendment uh, again today. Uh, my right honourable friend, uh, the member for Somerset North, uh, tabled what I thought were constructive amendments, which I was happy to sign. And I hope still, even at this late stage, the government will see that there is a basis uh, for progress to be made there. But as these things stand, like my right honourable friend, the member for Chingford and Woodford Green, uh, we have to continue to press the case on the government. And I hope uh, if the House decides that they will uh, uh, reject these amendments, I hope they will actually vote for the Lords Amendment and then deal with the matter, then it gives the government yet a, a further chance uh, to resolve this matter. Because at the end of the day, we are not asking uh, that the taxpayer should pick up the burden on this. We're asking that the leaseholders should be relieved, certainly in the short term, of the pressures that fall upon them that they are unable to deal with. The government is a, in a position to fund the cash flow uh, that leaseholders cannot, and which is driving them into desperate situations 
It is absolutely right that they should then seek to recoup that from those who are responsible and those who have been at fault. There's nothing in uh, the Laws Amendment or my right honourable friends uh, amendments that will prevent that happening. So I do urge the government to think again uh, and uh, recognise uh, that although the core elements of the bill are good, by uh, collaterally it does real injustice to innocent leaseholders such as many in my constituency and elsewhere. And for heaven's sake, can we not find a constructive way forward to achieve the objectives of the bill and to protect innocent leaseholders? They should not be mutually incompatible. But at the moment, we have not yet found that solution. Thank you. And we now go to the final speaker before I meet, bring the minister in, Paul Blomfield. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And... I actually think that the Prime Minister framed this debate well, because he told the House on the 3rd of February that, and I quote, no leaseholder should have to pay for the unaffordable costs of fixing safety defects that they did not cause and are no fault of their own. Those were his words, no ifs, no buts, an unequivocal pledge. But clearly the government's measures so far fall well short of fulfilling it. And today we have the opportunity to address that because the Lord's Amendments make good that failure. I've spoken in the House previously about leaseholders in the Metis Building, Wicker Riverside, Daisy Spring Works and others in my constituency who face a range of issues with ACM and other cladding, compartmentation, flammable materials, wrongly used and other fire safety products. are trapped in homes that are unsafe and unsaleable facing bills that will break them, some up to £50,000 each. And let's remember, we're talking about young people who stretch their budgets to the limit to buy their first home, couples unable to move on when they have their first child, others who can't take new jobs because they can't sell, older people who've sunk their life savings into their flat and have nowhere to turn. But under unbearable pressure and unimaginable mental strain, People who told me they fear collecting their post in the morning because of the bills it might contain. It is simply unacceptable. Today, we can end that misery. Now, those who say that the cost shouldn't fall on the public purse are right. Developers responsible should, be, should pay up. And those failed, failings in the uh, building regulation system too. The only way that developers will be held to account and others responsible is if the government own the problem, urgently undertake remediation, then use the full resources of the state to chase down those responsible. Leaseholders simply can't do it on their own. And we have that responsibility because successive governments oversaw the flawed system of building inspections, which signed off so many of these unsafe buildings. These, these leaseholders are victims of comprehensive regulatory failure. There's a grave injustice here that must be remedied, and the government must face up to it. Those who are responsible for the failing should be responsible for putting them right, without any costs falling on leaseholders, either now or in the future, through loan schemes. Many leaseholders have stretched their finances to the limit to buy their home. Some have already been bankrupted, Others are facing ruin. We have to put a stop to it today. So let's put aside other differences and do the right thing by accepting the Lord's amendments. Uh, thank you. I apologise to those who didn't get in, but I do need to bring the minister in. Minister. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And I want to thank all right honourable honourable members for their contributions today. The House will know that we have a duty to implement clear and effective legislation to support fire and building safety reform. We have an obligation in this place to make good law. And whilst I entirely accept that the motivations of all those that have contributed today uh, are not to damage the fire safety bill, I have to tell them that the practical consequence of passing the Lord's amendments would be to do that because the amendments are ineffective and defective. Let me explain why before moving on to some of the other points which members have made. The amendments prevent any type of remediation costs uh, being passed on to leaseholders, even if the cost was very minor. 
or in those cases where the leaseholder was responsible for damage. And that is not a proportionate response. There's no framework in the St Albans Amendment to distinguish between different works. And I think all members would agree that the taxpayer should not be paying for minor costs like replacing a smoke alarm and that if the leaseholder is responsible for breaking a smoke alarm, in all likelihood the leaseholder should fix it. The amendment is also unclear on who should take responsibility for remediation works until a statutory funding scheme is in place to pay or direct the costs. And that would result in remediation being delayed, even in the case of minor defects, if routes of cost recovery are in unclear. These orphans, I will not, if the honourable gentleman will mind, because I've got to conclude my remarks, perhaps if I've got a little bit of time at the end I will, because these orphan liabilities would leave leaseholders continuing to live in unsafe properties with no further clarity as to who will pay. It's important to ensure that taxpayers' money is protected as much as possible and that remediation is not delayed unnecessarily in extended litigation such as we might find ourselves in. It's not the solution leaseholders need, nor the one the taxpayer deserves. Now, my right honourable friend, the member for North Somerset, has also tabled an, an amendment, and it desires to provide greater clarity than perhaps other amendments do. But this amendment also shares some of the defects of the St Albans Amendment. It applies to any form of remediation, including wear and tear, and there is no cost threshold on what works should not be considered. Moreover, the amendment also provides that the Home Secretary will essentially be acting in a quasi-judicial role to adjudicate whether appropriate parties should pay costs of remediation. And my right honourable friend, the member for Witham, will find herself apportioning liability for any building with two or more dwellings on a building-by-building building basis for any possible cost associated with the fire safety order. That would take years. Leaseholders may be unable to sell or move until their building has been considered. And without much more clarity on how these decisions are to be made, the government itself could be open to judicial review, slowing down important implementation of policy and diverting taxpayers' money toward litigation once again. We believe we should seek to keep these decisions on liability in the hands of the courts, not those of politicians. However, there are points on which we do agree. And that is on, for example, the principle around forfeiture. It is a draconian measure that should only be used as a last resort. We believe that this matter should be considered as part of our wider programme on leasehold reform that we have already indicated. Adding it to the fire safety bill purely for fire safety order costs will create a tangle of loopholes and potential for satellite litigation. My right honourable friend also talked about the apportionment of costs. Well, he will know that the government has announced a uh, consultation on a tax measure on the development sector to ensure that the developers, those with the broadest shoulders, pay their way. We reckon that will yield at least £2 billion over the period. Of course, we'll want to keep that under review and ensure that we uh, are making sure that those who ought to pay do pay and that taxpayers and leaseholders are protected as far as they possibly can be. He also asked us to assure him that we will consider his own constituency case I'm very happy, as my right honourable friend, the Secretary of State, has done, to commit to look at that specific constituency matter and see what we can learn from the case study in North Somerset. Madam Deputy Speaker, in conclusion, these, these matters are defective, and I'm afraid I have to ask the House to respectfully disagree with their Lordships and reject their amendments. The